Yeah, talking freedom and liberation. Worldwide, not just only for the nation. A radical guy, it's time to make changes. Bringing interviews and radical education. A hearty welcome yeah. back to another episode of A Radical Podcast with me, your guide, Jason Bayless. It's wonderful to have you on board once again as we chart a course through the winding labyrinth of anarchism, revolutionary ideas, and the indomitable spirit of dissent. In the episode today, we've crafted a collection of varied segments that aim not just to tickle your intellect, but also nudge you into re-examining your worldview. Our explorative trek will cut across epochs and territories, making pit stops at ancient intellectual traditions, vibrant present-day movements, and the inspiring sagas of groups tenaciously pushing for sweeping transformations. Always remember, this isn't just a podcast, it's a conversation, a shared expedition toward gaining insights and questioning the status quo. So I encourage you to get comfortable, let your thoughts wander freely, and accompany me on this mind-stirring adventure. Without further ado, let's embark on another journey into the exhilarating universe of a radical podcast. Let's get this exploration underway. Let's go. Recently, the usually serene Swiss town of St. Emier traded in its routine tranquility for a bubbling international flurry of anarchist enthusiasts. When you think of Switzerland, you might picture precision crafted watches and trains that arrive on the dot. But this time, this nation found itself under the spotlight for a rather different reason the jubilant celebration of structured anarchism. The small town between the 19th and 23rd of July welcomed a sizable influx of visitors from every corner of the globe, lending an uncommonly vibrant character to its typically placid aura. What's the occasion, you ask? Well, it's the commemoration of the 150th anniversary of a watershed moment in the history of anarchism, the creation of the anarchist St. Emier International. Born out of a significant ideological schism within the First International in 1872, this organization was born when key figures like Mikhail Bakunin and James Guillaume were shown the door. This new St. Emir International soon became a magnet for those affiliated with the First International who rebuffed the Hague Congress's resolutions, adopting a program that closely mirrored Bakunin's principles. While it disbanded by 1877, the reverberations of the anarchist St. Emier International's impact were felt at this recent gathering. This wasn't any ordinary festivity, but a monumental event pulsating with intellectual pursuits and cultural endeavors. The itinerary included 268 lectures and workshops, 48 concerts, 42 film showings, 11 theatrical performances, seven exhibits, and a book fair. Participants were encouraged to ponder over the shifting political and social terrains, spotlighting the game-changing contributions that anarchists have made across a 150-year span of history. The folks behind the event offered up a new angle for those who might equate anarchy with pandemonium and disorder. For the event's website, anarchy isn't synonymous with chaos or a lack of order. Quite the contrary. It promotes an anti-authoritarian stance, underscoring a personal and social organization that fosters the emancipation of every human being. This gathering in St. Emier served as a tribute to the enduring resonance of these ideas and the communities that champion them. It was an unusual cultural and historical episode that jostled the typical Swiss rhythm of life, even managing to interrupt the typically infallible train schedules, making it a story worth remembering. So there you go, friends. Straight from the land of spot-on trains and meticulously crafted watches, we bring you a fascinating narrative of anarchy, history, and the celebration of anti-authoritarian values. As always, we'll keep you in the loop as more news unfurls. Welcome once again to this week's segment of Resistance Around the World where we're setting out on a thrilling expedition, tracking the birth and growth of ideas that parallel what we call anarchism today. At its heart, anarchism is about throwing down the gauntlet to unjust authority and nurturing a society where individuals have the liberty to govern themselves. As we set out on this intellectual journey, here's an interesting point. The term anarchist, as we comprehend it in our present context, wasn't exactly on everyone's lips during much of the times and societies we're about to traverse. So the figures and movements we'll touch upon might not have recognized themselves under this banner. Nevertheless, their ideals, actions, and struggles 
pulsate with the principles we associate with anarchism today. By unraveling the growth of these thoughts, we can deepen our understanding of how varying cultures and eras grappled with notions of power, independence, and societal structuring. This insight not only helps us value the multifaceted groundwork upon which contemporary anarchist thought stands, but also possibly uncovers lessons relevant to the dilemmas of our own era. On this explorative trek, we'll journey from the philosophical pushbacks against imposed authority by ancient China's Taoist and Greece's cynics, all the way to the groundbreaking experiment of people's direct involvement in their governance, a concept we call direct democracy. This practice is currently unfurling in Rojava, a fascinating region in the 21st century world. Before we strap on our metaphorical backpacks for this tour through history, let's unpack a crucial term, anarchism. In its most comprehensive definition, anarchism is a political doctrine that cheers for societies unshackled by coercive authority. Anarchists assert that voluntary cooperation should supersede forced hierarchy and often advocate direct action, mutual aid, and self-rule. So folks, let's start unwrapping these riveting chronicles of resistance. Let's dive into this fascinating journey together. We start our exploration with the Zhou Dynasty in China, approximately the 6th to 5th century BCE, where Taoism found its roots. This philosophy encourages a harmonious interaction with the Tao, a symbol of the spontaneous, natural, and ever-evolving rhythm of the universe. Key Taoist thinkers such as Lao Tzu and Chuang Tzu found themselves striking a discordant note in the stiff, hierarchical societies of their times. In his seminal work, Tao Te Ching, Lao Tzu voiced his disapproval of the stranglehold governments often maintain over their subjects. He proposed, governing a large country is like frying a small fish. You spoil it with too much poking. This metaphor paints his dream of a society where individuals lead their lives with minimal meddling from those in authority. While not explicitly called anarchist, this sentiment reverberates with the anarchist critique of state intrusion and their backing for self-rule. Taoist introduces the concept of wu wei, or non-action, indicating a style of governance that doesn't overstep into people's lives. Picture a society where the role of the leadership is not to command, but to facilitate and support. The leaders only intervene to sustain equilibrium, otherwise leaving communities to troubleshoot and make decisions autonomously. This principle harmonizes with the anarchist value of decentralization, signifying the distribution of decision-making abilities across communities rather than consolidating them within a central power. To observe these principles in action today, Cast your eyes toward the Zapatista communities in Chiapas, Mexico. Here, decision-making is a collective endeavor and power is dispersed. Simultaneously, but across the globe in ancient Greece, the cynics, particularly Diogenes of Sinop, began scrutinizing societal norms and structures. Diogenes' assertion, I am a citizen of the world, discards the idea of nationalism in favor of a universal human fraternity. This perspective echoes contemporary expressions of international solidarity, a recurring motif in anarchist philosophy. These initial philosophies, although not explicitly tagged anarchist, enshrined key anarchist tenets, resisting unjust hierarchy, advocating for minimal state interference, and championing a global human community. As we shift gears into our next section, we'll probe more profound into how the turbulence of the Warring States period shaped Taoist and Buddhist thinking. We'll explore how this period paved the way for communities built on egalitarian values, equal rights and opportunities for everyone, pushing back against centralized power. We now turn our gaze towards the Warring States period, a tumultuous chapter in ancient China's history that spanned from 475 to 221 BCE. As seven states jostled for supremacy, the pages of this particularly violent era in Chinese history were etched with tales of shifting power dynamics, strategic alliances, and groundbreaking reforms. Notable among these was the work commissioned by Qin Shaogong, which played a pivotal role in paving the way for the unification of China under Emperor Qin Shi Huang. Amidst this turmoil, the fertile ground for social and philosophical transformation was laid bare. Three philosophies made their mark during this period of upheaval, Confucianism, Taoism, and Legalism, each sketching its own roadmap to peace and balance. Confucianism, deeply rooted in the teachings of Confucius, aimed to build a society structured around familial loyalty and deference to authority, underscoring moral and ethical growth within an explicit hierarchy. On the other hand, Legalism, heralded by figures like Han Fei, 
lean towards strict laws and harsh penalties, predicated on the notion of innate human selfishness. These rules favor the interests of the ruler, with an eye to maintaining control and order within the state. In stark contrast to the sternness of Confucianism and legalism, Taoism, as envisioned by thinkers like Zhuangzi, presented a wholly different paradigm. It extolled the virtues of living in harmony with the Tao, the natural flow of the universe. The Taoist principle of Wu Wei, or effortless action, suggested that societies operate optimally when they move in a natural rhythm, untouched by overbearing centralized authority or hierarchical edifices. This idea finds a strong resonance with the anarchist ethos of spontaneous order and voluntary association, hinting at a society that operates organically, where individuals interact freely and on equal terms. At the same time, this volatile period saw an interesting development at the grassroots level, the rise of the fang shi. These wandering alchemists, healers, and diviners rejected state power and societal norms, opting to dwell on the outskirts of mainstream society. Illustrious figures like Ge Hong, a renowned fang shi and author of Bao Puzi, offer us a window into the lives and practices of these individuals. Their quest for knowledge in the mystical provides us with a peek into an early alternative societal structure. Amidst the chaos of the Warring States period, utopian communities also began to emerge. Often taking shape in defiance of the increasingly centralized states, these communities presented alternatives to the prevailing systems. The Wellfield system of the Zhou dynasty is a case in point, an idealized model of land distribution underlining communal and cooperative labor. The ripple effects of such a system were far-reaching, attenuating social disparities, fostering community solidarity, and providing for vulnerable groups such as the elderly, widows, orphans, and the disabled. These transformative movements during the Warring States period offer a multidimensional look at early instances of principles harmonizing with anarchism. The philosophical exploration by Taoist, the Fang Shai lifestyle, and the rise of utopian communities represent diverse expressions of these principles. As we reflect on this era, we invite you to ponder how these ancient principles have given shape to contemporary movements and ideas, how they bear resemblance to modern incarnations of anarchism and what lessons we can glean from the past to better comprehend our present and shape our future. As we navigate through history, remember that it's not just a timeline of dates and events, but a narrative of philosophies, ideas, and individuals who dared to deviate from the norm. The reverberations of their thoughts and actions continue to shape societies and cultures today. The echoes of the past carry with them the potential to influence our present and future significantly. As we step across the threshold from the ancient world into the epics of the Middle Ages and the Renaissance, we find ourselves in eras defined by the colossal sway of the church, stark socioeconomic disparities, and inflexible societal norms. However, even within these rigid frameworks, we can trace the early sprouts of defiance against hierarchical authority in myriad forms across the globe. Even with religion playing a central role in structuring society, voices of dissent, within the Christian faith started to make their presence felt, challenging both churchly and worldly authority. Let's take a stroll through the Middle Ages, a period when movements like the Cathars, the Waldensians, and the Brethren of the Free Spirit took center stage. These groups brought to the fore some radical theological ideas that, in many respects, echo what we've come to understand as the spirit of anarchism. They champion notions of spiritual equality, poverty, and a yearning for the simplicity of early Christian communities before the rise of institutionalized religion. Take, for example, the Cathars, a Christian dualist sect that thrived in southern France from the 12th to the 14th centuries. They subscribed to the belief in two opposing deities, one good and one evil. They turned their backs on the hierarchical structure of the church, the notion of sacraments, and the worship of saints and relics. The fabric of their communities, woven with threads of ascetic living and gender equality, bears an uncanny resemblance to aspects of modern anarchist thought. Likewise, the Waldensians, steered by Peter Waldo in the 12th century, put their weight behind religious poverty and the concept of living in the world, but not of it. They stood against the act of taking oaths, a clear mark of defiance against both religious and secular authority. Despite facing intense persecution, their legacy lives on in several contemporary Protestant churches. The Brethren of the Free Spirit, active from the 13th to the 14th centuries, place the individual's spiritual experiences at the heart of their philosophy. 
They held the belief that they could attain a state of perfection free from sin and as a consequence beyond the reach of moral, ecclesiastical, and secular laws. Let's shift our focus now to the pirate societies that flourished during the golden age of piracy from the late 17th to early 18th centuries. Even within these circles, there was a clear pushback against hierarchical systems. Contrary to their villainous portrayal, these crews often implemented forms of direct democracy and egalitarianism. Pirate codes or articles laid down rules for the ship, including equal distribution of food and drink, compensation for injuries, and collective decision-making. But pirate societies were more than just a den of lawlessness. They stood as symbols of resistance to national and imperial authority. Their denial of state power and their establishment of self-governing communities on the high seas have a touch of the proto-anarchy about them. Despite their rough-and-tumble existence, they offered an alternative societal structure beyond the traditional hierarchies. Finally, we turn our attention to the legend of Libertatia, this so-called anarchist utopia likely a figment of the imagination conjured up in the late 17th century book, A General History of the Pirates, may not be historically accurate. However, the ideology it espouses holds significant weight. Libertatia, as described, was a free colony on Madagascar, set up by pirates, runaway slaves, and European defectors. It did away with private property, ensured freedom of religion, and fostered collective labor. Even if Libertatia only existed in the realm of fiction, it embodied an early vision of an anarchist society. It symbolizes the longing for a world free from exploitation, coercion, and hierarchy, a longing that has fueled resistance movements throughout history and continues to spark the imagination of anarchists today. By studying these diverse expressions of dissent and resistance from the Middle Ages to the Renaissance, we can discern the impact of these historical forms of dissent on many modern anarchist movements. Just as the Waldensians, Cathars, and pirate crews rejected the authority of their time, today's anarchist groups challenge the power structures of our era, aiming for a society that mirrors the egalitarian spirit and direct democracy that these historical groups advocated. We see ideas in line with core anarchist principles continually echoing throughout human history, reminding us of the enduring relevance of these lessons in our contemporary context. Embarking on a journey back in time, we find ourselves in the northeastern region of North America, where the remarkable Haudenosaunee Confederacy flourished. Known as the Iroquois League or the Six Nations, this indigenous confederation offers a fascinating glimpse into principles strikingly similar to modern anarchist thought. The confederacy was a vibrant tapestry of Six Nations, each with its own unique traits. The Mohawk, who were renowned for their diplomatic prowess. The Oneida, often referred to as the people of the stone, were noted for their peaceful demeanor. The Onondaga, custodians of the council fire, served as the political heart of the Confederacy. The Cayuga, or people of the Great Swamp, were crucial contributors to the spiritual beliefs of the Confederacy. The Seneca, the people of the Big Hill, were known for their warrior culture. And lastly, the Tuscarora, who joined the Confederacy later, brought with them a wealth of agricultural knowledge. The political structure of the Confederacy, captured in the Great Law of Peace, offers one of the earliest instances of participatory democracy. This political charter mandated consensus on societal decisions. Councils, consisting of representatives from each nation, regularly convene in longhouses, participating in thoughtful discussions until a unanimous agreement was reached, ensuring all voices were heard and valued. What stands out about the Haudenosaunee Confederacy is its impressive balance of power, particularly between the genders. Clan mothers, respected female elders, wielded the power to appoint and, if necessary, depose the male chiefs or sachems. Each chief would express the decisions of his respective clan within council meetings, guaranteeing that the collective voice echoed through the halls. Crucially, clan mothers significantly influenced land and resource decisions, setting an early example of gender equality and female empowerment. Their seven generations principle adds a layer of intrigue to their societal philosophy. This principle emphasizes a holistic perception of time and environmental stewardship. This ideology manifested in sustainable farming practices, rotational hunting, and fishing to preserve animal populations, and sacred ceremonies celebrating the symbiosis between humans and nature. Interestingly, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy didn't exist in a vacuum. It left a profound imprint on Western political thought. 
Their democratic processes and stress on consensus decision-making were widely admired and served as a source of inspiration during the Enlightenment era, contributing to the emergence of political philosophies that underscored individual liberties and participatory governance. However, it's important to highlight that even though we're focusing on a specific historical period in this exploration, the Haudenosaunee Ga Confederacy is not merely a relic of the past. It continues to exist today, a testament to the endurance and adaptability of these indigenous nations. Through many generations, despite attempts at assimilation and external pressures, the nations of the Haudenosaunee Ga Confederacy have firmly upheld their cultures and traditions. They serve as living reminders of their ancestors' wisdom, holding steadfastly to their unique social structures, cultural practices, and respect for the natural world. Their ongoing story of resistance, survival, and continuity offers valuable insights for us today. It underscores the relevance of their historical experiences to our contemporary discussions around decentralization, equality, and sustainable living. In essence, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy paints a potent historical picture of anarchistic principles in action, decentralized power, gender equality, environmental mindfulness, and participatory democracy. Their influence has resonated far beyond their geographical boundaries, shaping political philosophies and systems throughout the world. We'll continue to unravel these influences as we journey further into the Enlightenment and Age of Revolutions in the next segment of our exploration. Immersing ourselves into the vivid tableau of human history, we land in the throes of the Age of Enlightenment, a monumental epoch stretching from the 17th to the 19th centuries. This time was a seismic intellectual shift, as several of Europe's daring thinkers began to question long-standing assumptions about religion, politics, and society structure. These rebels of thought called for an embrace of reason, individual liberties, and the free play of the intellect. Their views opposed a world where power was primarily in the hands of the church and monarchy and where the station of birth largely determined one's life course. Among these intellectuals, we encounter stellar personalities like John Locke, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, and Thomas Paine, each of whom contributed essential philosophies that would become catalysts for revolutionary change. Locke, often hailed as the father of liberalism, made a bold argument in his seminal work, Two Treatises of Government, suggesting that political power is only legitimate when it has the consent of those governed. This was a drastic detour from the accepted divine rights of kings. Then we meet Rousseau, the philosopher hailing from Geneva, whose audacious ideas expressed in the social contract pushed Locke's concepts further. Rousseau argued that the collective will of the people should dictate governmental actions, thus proposing an early form of direct democracy where each citizen has an equal voice in the affairs of the state. We also cannot forget Thomas Paine, one of the founding fathers of the United States and a strong advocate for human rights, and notably a vehement opponent of slavery. This stance set him apart from many of his contemporaries. In his influential works Common Sense and Rights of Man, he delivered blistering critiques against monarchy and aristocracy, calling for a republic where the people have a direct say in governmental matters. During this intellectual sea change, the world was in the grip of epic historical happenings. The American Revolution, 1765 to 1783, and the French Revolution, 1789 to 1799, both of which rebelled against monarchical rule and called for representative governance. The American Revolution, deeply influenced by Enlightenment ideals of personal freedom and governance by consent, fundamentally contested arbitrary rule with the resounding cry of, no taxation without representation, signifying the dramatic shift in the understanding of individual and communal rights. Across the pond, the French Revolution, propelled by socioeconomic disparities and Enlightenment philosophies, sought to dismantle the absolute monarchy and feudal system. Its guiding principles, liberty, equality, fraternity, highlighted the aspiration for a society devoid of authoritarian control, values that align seamlessly with anarchistic philosophies. Although neither revolution led to outright anarchist societies, they served as significant stepping stones toward radical societal shifts. The French Revolution's reign of terror, despite its brutal nature, eroded aristocratic dominance, hinting at the potential for more egalitarian structures of power. In these earth-shattering events and the innovative dialogue of the Enlightenment, we see the foundational roots of modern conversations about power and authority. This era paved the way for anarchism to sprout and flourish. It nurtured the philosophical seeds 
that would eventually bloom into modern anarchism. The reverberations of this era continue to be felt in our present world. They stand as a testament to the enduring influence of critical thought and the power of collective action in shaping societies. Modern protests advocating for political or societal change carry the indomitable spirit of the Enlightenment within them. As we grapple with our present challenges, we continue to draw inspiration and provocation from these Enlightenment era philosophies, challenging the status quo and striving for a better world. Continuing our exploration through history's vast panorama, our next stop is the mid 19th century United States, a period indelibly marked by one of the nation's most decisive social battles, the struggle to abolish slavery. Amidst this turmoil, a potent faction surfaced within the larger abolitionist movement, the Garrisonians. Taking their name from William Lloyd Garrison, a standout abolitionist figure of the time, the Garrisonians were differentiated by their unflinching commitment to nonviolence and principled rejection of what is termed coercive authority. If you're scratching your head at this term, coercive authority refers to any form of power that leans on force, intimidation, or manipulation to steer or influence people's actions. In 1831, Garrison inaugurated The Liberator, a weekly newspaper that became a lighthouse of abolitionist literature. Under his leadership, the Liberator rose as a strong voice, advocating not just the immediate abolition of slavery, but also full civil rights for Black Americans. The newspaper's stance was defined by an unwavering belief in transforming hearts and minds over depending on the political or legal systems, which it viewed as inherently corrupt and unfair. It championed direct action or the idea of taking measures to instigate change directly rather than asking others to enact those changes on our behalf. A noteworthy point to highlight here is the Garrisonians' uncharacteristic support for women's rights for their time. At the World Anti-Slavery Convention held in London in 1840, Garrison famously elected to sit with the female delegates who were barred from their rightful seats due to their gender. This event served as a catalyst for numerous Garrisonians, including Susan B. Anthony, a notable suffragist, propelling them to advocate even more fervently for women's rights. Despite the Garrisonians not explicitly identifying as anarchists, their beliefs and actions mirrored many principles inherent to anarchism. Their renouncement of coercive state authority, their emphasis on individual freedom, and their promotion of direct action align quite closely with the tenets of anarchistic ideology. Yet, it's crucial to acknowledge that the Garrisonian strategy was not universally accepted. Critics contended that their refusal to engage with political and legal systems was both unrealistic and impractical, arguing that substantive systemic change demanded participation within these institutions, imperfections, and all. Before we wrap up, let's not overlook the lasting impact of the Garrisonians. Their devotion to direct action and protest has shaped many successive social and political movements. We can draw a direct line from the philosophy and tactics of the Garrisonians to landmark events like the civil rights movement and contemporary expressions of anarchism. This observation reaffirms the importance of the Garrisonians in our journey through history, exploring how the spirit of anarchism manifests within specific cultural and historical contexts, another vibrant thread in our intricate tapestry of resistance and freedom woven across the ages. As we venture deeper into the captivating landscape of the 19th century, we turn a fresh page in the annals of political philosophy. This moment in time marks the genesis of what we've come to know as modern anarchism. Anarchism refers to a political philosophy that envisions societies void of hierarchical authorities, including states, corporations, and religious institutions. This period of transformation welcomed the rise of thinkers who boldly began to question the established order and for the first time confidently identified themselves as anarchists. Amidst these trailblazers, three figures stand head and shoulders above the rest, Pierre-Joseph Proudhon, Mikhail Bakunin, and Peter Kropotkin. First up, we meet Pierre-Joseph Proudhon, a French philosopher who etched his name into the annals of history by being the first individual to publicly label himself an anarchist. His groundbreaking work, What is Property?, made waves by asserting, property is theft. Proudhon challenged the conventional norms surrounding private property ownership, championing instead a society where goods are allocated based on individual needs, an echo of the anarchist values of communal sharing and equality. Next, 
Our journey transports us to the heartlands of Russia, the birthplace of Mikhail Bakunin. A fiery revolutionary, Bakunin emerged as a pivotal figure in the early anarchist movement. His vigorous advocacy for workers' self-management was in stark contrast with the philosophy of Karl Marx, who proposed the concept of the dictatorship of the proletariat, where the working class wields political power. Bakunin, however, was convinced that all forms of governmental power, even those birthed by revolution, would inevitably result in oppression, a conviction that highlights the anarchist push for stateless societies. Our trip takes us to yet another Russian anarchist, Peter Kropotkin. Renowned for his concept of mutual aid, Kropotkin argued that collaboration within species was equally essential for survival as competition, a departure from the then-prevailing social Darwinist views that emphasized survival of the fittest. Kropotkin's vision, as articulated in his work The Conquest of Bread, depicted societies where voluntary associations address societal needs, mirroring the anarchist ideal of voluntary cooperation and collective self-governance. As anarchism was gaining a foothold in Europe, an intriguing fusion of Western anarchist thought and Eastern philosophies began to crystallize in China. Influential Chinese intellectuals like Li Shizing and Wu Jihui discovered parallels between the anarchist critique of state and social hierarchies and the traditions of Taoism and Buddhism. The Paris Group, a cohort of Chinese intellectuals studying in France, including Li and Wu, embraced and propagated anarchist ideas. They tapped into Taoist teachings about natural harmony and Buddhist principles of equality and compassion. This intermingling of ideas exemplifies the adaptability of anarchist thought, which finds resonance across various cultures and philosophical traditions. Thus, the 19th century emerges as a significant milestone in the evolution of anarchism. It was during this epoch that the philosophy began to coalesce around a defined set of principles, attracting followers from diverse cultural backgrounds. This era birthed the anarchism we recognize today, a dynamic blend of ideas advocating for stateless, equal societies that value individual liberty and collective cooperation. So hang on to your hats because we're about to steer into the choppy seas of the 20th century next. We'll dissect the Zapatista movement's resistance against neoliberal globalization in Mexico and delve into the contributions of Chinese anarchist Ba Jin to the world of literature and anarchist philosophy. Our exploration into the captivating universe of resistance has many more miles to traverse. As we journey into the 20th century, we witness the continuing influence of anarchism philosophy on social and political movements worldwide. This era heralds the rise of fresh voices and interpretations, most notably in Latin America and Asia. The Zapatista movement in Mexico and the life and work of the Chinese anarchist Ba Jin offer illuminating examples of the influence and evolution of anarchist thought during this period. Let's begin our journey in Latin America, in the heart of Mexico, with the Zapatista Army of National Liberation, often referred to as the Zapatistas. This revolutionary leftist group emerged in the late 20th century and caught the public's attention on January 1st, 1994. This date masked the curtain of history rises on the enactment of the North American Free Trade Agreement, NAFTA. The Zapatistas viewed this event as the final blow to the livelihood of indigenous farming communities. Taking their name from Emiliano Zapata, a seminal figure in the Mexican Revolution, the Zapatistas found inspiration in Zapata's rallying cry of Tierra y Libertad land and freedom. Known for his fervent advocacy for land reforms, Zapata stood as a beacon for peasant rights. His resonant calls for justice and fairness reverberated through the decades, eventually finding a harmonious echo in the Zapatista movement. Defying the typical ambitions of many political movements, the Zapatistas did not seek to capture state power. Instead, they rose as champions for the rights of indigenous peasants and workers, standing in opposition to neoliberal globalization which they saw as an impending storm over their communities. They cultivated a unique approach that combined indigenous communal traditions with the tenets of anarchist and libertarian socialist ideologies, urging for more autonomy and collective decision-making. Consider, if you will, how they breathe life into their ideology. Through their uprising, they birthed autonomous municipalities where power was not a privilege of the few, but a shared responsibility among the community. They championed direct communal organization, horizontal decision-making, and a focus on sustainability and autonomy. These actions epitomized the core principles of anarchism, 
offering a real-world example of anarchism's practical application in a modern context. Now, let's cast our eyes from the rugged landscapes of Latin America to the vibrant metropolises of Asia, where we meet Bajin, an influential figure in the world of anarchism. A revered Chinese author, Bajin wielded the power of his eloquent narratives to infuse anarchist ideas throughout China in the 20th century. Born as Li Fagan, he later adopted the pen name Bajin, a fusion of the names of two renowned European anarchists, Mikhail Bakunin and Peter Kropotkin. His encounter with anarchism in the 1920s, especially Kropotkin's brand of anarchist communism, left an indelible mark on his worldview. To truly appreciate Bajin's influence, we must peruse his famous work, The Family. This novel shines a spotlight on the stifling hierarchical structures that mar traditional Chinese family life. Bajin employed his potent storytelling to critique the authoritarian societal norms of his era, pushing for individual freedom. His captivating narratives disseminated anarchist ideas, shaping public discourse, and cementing his place as a pivotal figure in 20th century Chinese anarchism. Through our exploration of the Zapatista movement and Bajin, we bear witness to the lasting relevance of anarchism across the span of the 20th century and across diverse cultures. From the mountainous terrains of Chiapas to the bustling lanes of China's cities, the spirit of resistance continues to thrive, shaping and being shaped by the dynamic philosophy of anarchism. Now, as we step into the dawn of the 21st century, the anarchist spirit of resistance and radical transformation remains alive and strong, sparking new movements that persist in questioning established political and social structures. One such movement that has drawn the world's gaze is the Rojava movement in northern Syria. This intriguing movement offers a snapshot of how the principles of anarchism continue to find relevance in our contemporary world. In the upcoming leg of our journey, we'll unpack the origins, principles, and practices of the Rojava movement. We'll explore its remarkable emphasis on direct democracy, gender equality, and environmental sustainability, and discuss how this movement manifests the principles of anarchism in our present day. In doing so, we'll appreciate how the legacy of anarchism remains vibrant and influential, continuously adapting to address the challenges of each new era. Stepping into the heart of the Rojava movement, we encounter a distinct model that draws inspiration from the ideas of two towering figures. On one side, we have Murray Bookchin, an American social theorist celebrated for his groundbreaking ideas about ecology, libertarian municipalism, and social revolution. His thought-provoking works, including social ecology and communalism, stand as key pillars in the grand edifice of contemporary anarchist thought. If you find yourself intrigued and yearning to learn more about his theories, the Radical Audiobook series, featuring his work, would make an excellent next stop on your intellectual journey. On the other side, we find Abdullah Okalan, the incarcerated leader of the Kurdish liberation movement, who has fervently advocated for democratic confederalism and a vision of social ecology that aligns seamlessly with Bookchin's ideas. Together, the intellectual synergy of these two thinkers lays the philosophical foundation for the Rojava movement. This movement is delineated by three principal tenets that find their roots in the core precepts of anarchism. To begin with, it practices direct democracy. The administrative structure of Rojava is not a traditional centralized government, but rather a confederation of local councils designed to foster community involvement and grassroots decision making. Secondly, the Rojava movement is a loud and clear voice for gender equality. Women are not only participants, but active contributors in every layer of society, from local councils to militia groups. To underscore their commitment to this cause, they've formed women exclusive councils and have instituted a requirement for all leadership positions to be shared by a woman co-chair. The third pillar is a dedicated focus on environmental sustainability, painting a vision of an ecological society where humans live in mutual respect with nature. This commitment is visibly demonstrated in their reforestation projects and cooperative farming practices, underscoring the inseparable bond between social liberation and environmental preservation. In many ways, Rojava stands as a testament to the modern application of anarchist ideals. While the movement doesn't explicitly brand itself as an anarchist initiative, it undeniably embodies the spirit of anarchism and its stress on direct democracy, decentralized power, gender equality, and environmental stewardship. As we conclude our deep dive into the Rojava movement, it's abundantly clear that the far-reaching impact of anarchism continues to inspire and reshape our world.
From its early seeds in the Enlightenment era to its contemporary sprouts, such as Rojava, anarchism's influence has traversed centuries and continents, evolving and adapting to address the unique challenges of each era. As we journey further into the 21st century, the principles of anarchism will undoubtedly serve as a compass, pointing us towards more equitable and sustainable societal structures. Mapping out the intricate weave of anarchist ideas throughout the annals of history can feel like navigating a labyrinth with myriad twists and turns. The vast array of movements, philosophies, and societies we've journeyed through, from the time-honored wisdom of Taoist sages spurning authoritative control to Christian mavericks of the Middle Ages to the idealist visionaries and unconventional pirate societies in the Renaissance, were all birthed in an array of unique times and contexts. They were each propelled by their distinct convictions and values, and while they certainly share conceptual overlaps with what we today identify as anarchism, it's crucial to recognize that they were not anarchists in the contemporary sense of the term. As we bring our historical expedition to a close, one fact emerges crystal clear. Anarchism isn't a dusty philosophy relegated to textbooks or intellectual sparring. Starting from the initial murmurs during the Enlightenment period, right through to the vibrant and pulsating embodiment of these principles in the Rojava experiment of the 21st century, anarchism rises to the fore as a vibrant, evolving doctrine that continues to inspire and shepherd us towards societies that prize fairness, decentralization, and sustainability. However, this odyssey barely begins to plumb the depths. There exist an innumerable host of instances scattered across various cultures and eras which resonate with the spirit of anarchism many of which we simply could not delve into due to the constraints of time or paucity of meticulous historical documentation. As we journey through history, it's vital to stay vigilant against oversimplification and the pitfalls of imposing modern labels on past societies and individuals. Despite the manifold incarnations of anarchism throughout history, a consistent essence always glimmers through, an unyielding commitment to human freedom, equality, and collaboration. It's a rallying cry to question systems that perpetuate disparities, to stand up against unjust power, and to tirelessly work towards a future in which every individual can flourish. Although our journey has reached its destination, the vibrant spirit of anarchism endures, echoing in the actions of those who continue to push back against the status quo, dream of better worlds, and lay the groundwork for a freer, fairer future. The threads of resistance and the yearning for freedom equality, and collaboration are deeply interwoven into our collective human tapestry. As we steer our course through the turbulent waters of today, rife with economic disparities, social injustice, and a mounting climate crisis, the enduring legacy of anarchism stands as a powerful beacon, reminding us that another world isn't just a pipe dream. It's well within our collective power to make it a reality. Thank you for joining us on this fascinating foray into the rich tapestry of anarchism. This exploration is an open-ended invitation for you to continue the quest for knowledge, to question, and to engage critically with the narratives of history. At the very heart of anarchist thought lies a fierce spirit of inquiry and a refusal to accept any single narrative or ideology without critical scrutiny. As we stride into the future, may the spirit of anarchism continue to ignite curiosity, challenge prevailing narratives, and propel us all toward meaningful social and political transformation. Radical education, yeah, yeah, a better future, what we really need, not rooted in capitalism. Another edition of About a Radical Guide, where we keep your finger on the pulse of all the latest and greatest happenings over at A Radical Guide. I'm absolutely over the moon to unveil our latest jewel in the Radical Audiobook series, Social Ecology and Communalism, by the distinguished thinker, Murray Bookchin. Bookchin's oeuvre is a veritable gold mine of radical wisdom and thought-provoking insights, particularly for those with a hankering to delve into the compelling intersection of ecology and communalism. This one is a must-listen for anyone wanting to delve into these topics in more depth. So, what are you waiting for? Swing by a radical guide and add this exceptional work to your audiobook collection. In other exciting news, a radical podcast episode 13 titled Anarchy Suppressed in the United States, has been making quite the splash, racking up over 10,400 views on YouTube alone. And that doesn't even take into account the extra views from our other platforms. Seeing our ideas strike a chord with so many of you is truly humbling, sparking spirited conversation and fostering deeper contemplation. A hearty thank you to everyone who tuned in, spread the word about our podcast, and clicked that subscribe button. 
If you've yet to explore this episode or are keen on immersing yourself in our other episodes, drop by a radical guide. Now, let's turn our attention to a radical location that's been making some serious ripples, the Worker Solidarity Initiative in Pakistan. This libertarian labor movement operates on the principles of anarcho-syndicalism, advocating for a society steeped in freedom, mutual assistance, federalism, and self-governance. Their profile on a radical guide offers a detailed window into their commendable endeavors and guiding principles. The Worker Solidarity Initiative stands firm against any actions that could jeopardize the well-being of workers and their communities. They champion the power of self-education as a pathway to achieving total self-governance in every facet, from production and distribution to social organization and preserving an environmentally sound habitat. The WSI is steadfast in its opposition to all forms of economic and social monopoly, with no aspirations to command political power. Instead, they flourish on libertarian federalism. Their structure is choose hierarchy, fostering the autonomy of local and regional groups to take the reins of their own initiatives from the grassroots. Embodying universal humanistic values, the Worker Solidarity Initiative doesn't believe in borders, seeing the world as their home and all of humanity as their kin. They stand firm against all political and national barriers, committed to laying bare the often capricious violence enacted by governmental bodies. And there you have it, folks. From shiny new additions to our audiobook series, to the milestones clocked up by our podcast, to casting a spotlight on the inspiring work of the Workers' Solidarity Initiative in Pakistan, it's been quite the ride. Remember, you're an invaluable part of this lively community contributing to discourses that hold the power to reimagine and reshape our world. Let's go. And so, dear friends, we've arrived at the end of yet another thrilling chapter in our grand expedition into radical ideologies, captivating histories, and vibrant movements. We've journeyed through time, tracing the deep roots of anarchism from its ancient origins to its modern day manifestations. Our voyage has crisscrossed the globe from the flourishing practice of organized anarchy in Switzerland to the admirable efforts of the Worker Solidarity Initiative in Pakistan. We've reached key milestones in our own radical audiobook series and a radical podcast, igniting thought-provoking debates that challenge the status quo. As we draw this session to a close, remember that the path to dissent isn't a solitary hike. It's a communal pilgrimage, a rich mosaic of ideas, efforts, and historical tales. Every thread you untangle, every idea you scrutinize, every dialogue you partake in is a step forward on this road. I'd like to extend my sincere gratitude to all of you for joining us and for your active participation in this discourse, whether it's through lending an ear, spreading our message, or being a vocal participant. Your role here is important. Your curiosity fuels our collective. Your voices, in their questioning, challenging, and striving for a more equitable world, reverberate louder than you might realize. As we say our goodbyes for now, don't forget to dive into the latest addition to our Radical Audiobook series and acquaint yourself with the work of the Workers' Solidarity Initiative over at A Radical Guide. For those hungry to uncover more about the realm of anarchism and radical thought, our platform is a treasure chest of resources designed to educate, inspire, and engage. If you find our content and resources beneficial, please consider supporting us in two significant ways. Add to our site with a location. The more locales we feature, the richer our guide becomes. By raising awareness about radical locations, you're helping to weave a global tapestry of dissent and fostering community growth. Contribute financially. Sustaining this platform requires considerable time, effort, and resources. Every single donation, no matter how small, allows us to continue providing this space for radical dialogue and discovery. So, until we cross paths again, keep your curiosity alive, stay questioning, and always remember, the path of resistance is an ongoing journey, but it's a voyage we're undertaking together. Take care, and keep the flame of radical thought burning bright. Yeah, talking freedom and liberation Worldwide, not just only for the nation A radical guide, it's time to make changes Bringing interviews and radical education Yeah, yeah, a better future, what we really need Not rooted in capitalism or supremacy Yeah, yeah, trust, you don't want to miss it We bring the truth right to you The past, present, and future, let's go A, a radical guide, that's what this is Highlighting the diverse world of resistance Let's go